Okay, so Ian, thanks for talking to us today and welcome to the podcast first and foremost. Now, I suppose most of the people who watch and listen to this podcast will know pretty much everything there is to know about you. But for those that are perhaps not too familiar, could you just talk to us about your career and some of your proudest moments to date? Yeah, okay. So I really started in design when I was very young. You know, when I was at school, I wanted to be a designer and uh, I wanted to be a product designer, industrial designer. But even at a very young age, I I realized that motor cars was my real uh, um, point of interest. And so I turned to that and and focused on it right through schooling. And eventually I uh, was at the Royal College of Art in London. And then I went to Ford Motor Company in in Essex and and around the world uh, for about 11 years. And did, uh, did a number of things with Ford. And then I worked with a small company called TWR. We created a design department. And we created some some interesting cars, including at the time, uh, many Aston Martins, because Aston at the time did not have a design department. And so we got involved in designing Aston Martins, the first one being the DB7, which is now a long time ago. But of course, at the time, it was quite a quite a fantastic thing for us to be doing. You know, this is back in the early 90s. And that led to one or two other Astons. And then eventually in 1999, I was asked to join Jaguar and I was at Jaguar for 20 years until 2019. And while at Jaguar, I was uh, tasked to almost reinvent the brand into the the brand we know now. And of course, I'd always loved Jaguar cars ever since I was very young. I I felt I understood the ethos of them and and the heritage of them very well. And what I realized was that um, they become too traditional. They were not traditional when I was growing up. They were quite radical and and very modern cars, certainly very British, but of a time. And so I saw it to my place to bring Jaguar back to the place it truly belonged. And that was a contemporary car company, which is what I spent 20 years doing, which culminated, of course, in, in creating um, a few electric cars towards <clears throat> towards the end of my career there. Yeah, you just mentioned there the whole sort of ethos and DNA of Jaguars being modern and contemporary. So how early was an electric Jaguar being considered and when did that process really begin? Well, we were, my, you know, my, my sort of assistant director was Julian Thompson and uh, Julian and I uh, effectively came up with the idea of creating a hybrid electric car way back in 2009. So we're talking about over 10, 12 years now. And um, that was CX-75. And we came up with the idea of charging the car off these little jet engines, which were, break, they were called blade and jets. And this is purely conceptual, of course. And we built a model to that effect. And it went to the Paris show, I think, in, in 2010. And it was, was a great hit. And, and that car then was looked at to go into production. It nearly went into production. It was well-developed. Uh, it was a hybrid. It still had an, an internal combustion engine in it, but it was predominantly powered off two electric motors. Now, that was over 10 years ago, so that's when we were seriously looking at electric cars. And the design department, which which I always believe is probably the most creative element of any car company, uh, was very keen to push the whole the whole idea of an electric car, either either in hybrid form, but not or you know extended range or range form or, or pure electric and and it's a difficult one because you know you have to convince a, a large number of people in the business that they need to to think about investing in a whole new a whole new drivetrain and you know it takes a while and it takes a long time but that was really the starting point 2010 was a starting point for us Okay, so going back to 2010 then, obviously the EV industry has grown quite considerably since then. There's so many more new models available on the market and EV charging infrastructure has grown quite considerably as well. So I just wanted to get your views on the sector as a whole, really, and sort of how you view the EV industry at the minute. Well, the the interesting thing about the car industry, and I've been, you know, I've been involved in the car industry now for 40 years and I've watched it evolve. But what I saw happening, you know, 2015, 2016, was a real step change in the car industry for a number of reasons, but we'll take the ecological one as, as, as the main main vehicle of change. And, you know, it, it had to go into an alternative form of, of, uh, of drivetrain. There was no doubt about it. That This was inevitable. 
And I think designers see these things much better and clearer than other people do. And it's been a real dilemma for the car industry to know when to jump and when to invest. You know, in 2015 or 2014, we're still designing and, and creating internal combustion engines, new ones, and investing in them. Now, I doubt very much if anybody nowadays, be very few people actually designing and, and creating new internal combustion engines, certainly not for the mass market. So they're almost already a thing of the past. You know, there'll be the existing ones will continue. They will be developed. Of course, they'll have to keep up with the, the various uh, regulations that are, that, uh, that are placed upon them. And so it's a very difficult time for the industry to know when to jump. Now, of course, all the, what's, what's, what the catalyst in this, of course, is the, is the legislation. You know, especially countries like the UK are saying by 2030, there will be no, one, more, no more internal combustion engine cars sold as new product, that is. Uh, and, and so therefore, the car industry has now got a clear mandate to move forward on electric. But that changeover has been a very, very hard decision making process. Because if you jump too early, you know, you may end up investing billions of pounds or euros or whatever and, and not having the right return, the right income. You know, that could kill a business. If you wait till it's too late, um, and then you may have lose, lose your internal combustion engine business beforehand. And so I've, I've seen this agony. Now what's happening, of course, is the, 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 the die has been cast. We know what is happening, and therefore everybody's focusing on electric. At the speed at which this comes in, it's going to be a, a, really a case of how quickly each individual car company, and they're all different sizes, of course, can, can operate. It's not just designing cars, it's the whole infrastructure, it's factories. And when you've got factories building a million cars a year, that are internal combustion engine, to move that whole operation into electric is an enormous task, bigger than anybody can imagine, billions and billions of pounds worth. And so... You know, that's starting to happen and it will probably happen in the right time. And I think the car industry will meet the demands with what's required, not just from a moral point of view, but from a legislative point of view as well. So by 2030, all new cars will probably be, or most of them will be electric. There's a talk of her hydrogen powered cars as well, hydrogen cells, but I think that will probably tend towards the more commercial side of, uh, of, of, of transportation trucks and such like. Uh, so, yeah, it's coming now and, and we're all working towards it and, it and it's probably a good thing. Yeah, and um, the, main, the main issue, of course, is, you know, and the governments and, and the local authorities have been uh, promoting the idea of electric cars for, for, you know, a number of two or three years now with, with the right attitude. But if, is the infrastructure there for everybody, and I mean everybody, to be able to use them properly? And that, I think, is the biggest question that we have to ask, have to ask and, and deal with at the moment. The car yeah. industry will deal with it. Can the local authorities and the governments and, and indeed private enterprise deal with the, the infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, certainly from some of the conversations I've been having, EV charging infrastructure is seen as the biggest barrier to that mass EV adoption. And well, that's how it's perceived anyway. But I just wanted to go back to when you said that the world is moving towards this electric future. And I mean, I think it was always going to happen. But as you said, you've been working in the car industry now for 40 years and you've sort of grown up in that classic car generation. So I just wanted to get your views on some of the different electric models that are out there today, because I actually uh, did some research before this interview and I found a quote from yourself where you said that there's not actually too many modern cars out there that you actually like. So I was just wondering, is, is that still the case? Well, they're an eclectic mix of cars. And I think there was a tendency to make them look a little bit strange and, and, and wacky. And um, I suspect that's coming a lot from the marketing and departments and, uh, and indeed the, the, the management, even the CEO of the business. You have to make it look different because it's got to appeal to slightly offbeat people. I think that side of it is disappearing. I think real designers are approaching designing electric cars will design them with the right sense of, of balance and, 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 uh, and, and decorum that they deserve, you know, I'd, I wouldn't go out to design an electric car to look wacky, just to appeal to, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, if I can say it in the sort of English terms, the, um, the kind of the anoraks of the world who love electric cars. That's not the point. You've got to appeal to most people, if not everybody. And therefore you've got to design it in the way you design any other car. What you design in, at, at the end of the day will be different because of the makeup and the build of the car. That's what creates a difference for me. It's not 
the desire to create something that looks deliberately different, although other people have taken a slightly different point of view. Um, I think they're becoming more mature. Uh, I think a lot of electric cars now, you'd be hard pushed to tell whether it's electric or, or you know, a traditional internal combustion engine until you until you hear it. And so, you know, that sense of doing something different is, is um, I think, disappearing. But they will be different because, as I say, the build-up and the, the package of the, the mechanics are very different. Uh, what does frustrate me slightly is that some of them are almost, in, in terms of the profile and the, and, the, and the package, are made to look more like conventional cars today in order to not frighten people away. And I can understand that. But when I did, uh, say, I was working on the I-Pace for Jaguar, I took every opportunity I could get to change the car into a different shape because I could. And I'm not seeing a lot of other people doing that. I see a more conventional profile uh, in some of these new electric cars. But um, I think if, if the, the, the package of an electric car with a skateboard allows you to do different things, you should do it. And I think if you look at the shape of an I-Pace, it's certainly different from a conventional SUV. Yeah, I wanted to come on to the iPace actually, because I mean, we cover all the different announcements of all the new EVs that are coming out. And it seems that every single designer and manufacturer in their press releases say, oh, we've done this, this and this to make our new EV look completely different to all our petrol and diesel cars. And I mean, I don't know too much. I'll hold my hands up. I don't know too much about the process of designing a car from start to finish. But it seems that from the eye pace, you almost sort of ripped up the rule book and, and started from a blank canvas. Yes, we did. You know, we followed the, the values of Jaguar, which is something people get very confused about, I know. But, um, you know, we had a skateboard and uh, above that skateboard and above a certain line on the, on the skateboard and, and wheel centers, we could do almost anything we wanted because there's, there's no engine or gearbox or drivetrain there to worry about. And so we consciously moved the occupants forward because we could, you know, normally as an engine in the front, you're pretty well dictated to where the, your pedal position is and your H point and everything else. So we moved the occupants forward to get more space in the car and, and to give it a cab forward um, stance. And, you know, this is something we found very appealing. And I think uh, if you're going to make a statement like that, make it very obvious. And the bonnet of, of, a, of an eye pace is very short. It's very short because there's only uh, an inverter in there and, and, and a few other bits and bobs, a uh, charger, and they don't take up a huge amount of room. And there's also a frunk, as we called it, a front trunk or a front boot, but um, it's quite small. There's not a lot of room left. And, and then, of course, there's crash requirements as well. So you do need some front end to the car. But we deliberately set about to do something. Um, uh, the, uh, we, we, we pushed the boundaries of packaging because we could. And if the net result gave us something that looked different, that was good. And that's what we wanted, yeah. Okay, so when you stand back and look at the iPace now, are you happy with the way it looks? Because there's that famous thing with artists where when they finish a painting, they'll stand back and look at it and add bits and bobs here and there and constantly touching it up. But with a car, once it's designed and goes into production and manufacturing, that's it, you, you can't touch it, it's done then. So. When you look at it now, are you happy with the way it looks? And, and where would you rank it among some of your other concepts? I, I rank it in, in, in my, you know, in my own portfolio or my team's portfolio, because it's a team of people. I rank it fairly high. I think it does the right things. I think compared with cars that are even coming out now in terms of its profile and stance and look, it does very well. I mean, the car is now, in my mind, is now five years old. I mean, we started a while ago. Um, I think the one thing we tended to put the 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 grill on the front because it is a grill intake. It does take in some air, and I'm probably contradicting myself a little bit here. But I wish I'd made the grill of the car a little less obvious in terms of being an air intake, because the amount of air that goes in the front of the car is very little. It's not as much as a convent internal combustion engine, and we can get most of it underneath. In fact, the front, the, the, the top half of the grill is actually just an open space into the, the rest of the bonnet. So it's only, only two thirds of it effectively our air intake. And even that, it's fairly minimal. So in retrospect, I think we should have done something a bit more daring with the grill of the car. And, and as I left the business, I prompted my team to try and have a look at that and see what they could do with it. Um, if only to signify that we don't actually need as much of a grill in the car as perhaps 
we would do it otherwise yeah but uh you know other than that the the excitement of the profile is still quite you know it's an suv suvs are generally square boxes you know and it's certainly not that so um you know for that reason and people say well it's not really an suv because it doesn't go off-road i've driven one off-road it's extremely capable off-road as capable as probably one of the best suvs which i won't mention in the world is going off-road because the electric drive drives the wheels very independently and they can really find traction whenever they want them when you know instant torque instant traction and its suv capabilities as an off-road vehicle are very very good indeed yeah you just touched on the driving credentials of the ipace there and i mean i'm sure you've driven quite a few nice cars in your time so in your opinion how does an electric car compare to those classic cars and just to petrol and diesel cars in general no, I, I, you know, it's like music. I, I don't like people categorizing music. I find, you know, I go to America and certain the radio stations all categorize the music into, into the genres, niches, and it's just nonsense, really, because you like music. You know, you can, you know, I'm, I'm sure most people in this country think similarly. Um, and cars shouldn't be categorized like that. You enjoy a car for what it is. They all have different characteristics. Some of my cars are 50 years old, the ones that I've collected, and they're very different to drive, and they're actually quite difficult. But the character they have are, 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 are fabulous, and I wouldn't want to ever lose that opportunity. However, we're moving on, and I find electric cars quite exciting to drive in a different way. You know, the, the, the acceleration is, is utterly spontaneous, and the, the pull away from traffic lights is just great fun. There's nothing like it because it's just instant torque, instant power. The cars are heavy, but unfortunately with skateboards, the weight is in the lower half of the car, so it's in the right place. Um, I know they're quite heavy cars. The, the centre of gravity is very low. And as I drive them, and I've driven through roads, especially in Scotland, where I, I know some of the roads very well, and I can compare them quite directly, and I find the way you drive the car a little different. You, Whereas with a normal car, you kind of... Th- you would drive it into the corner, brake a bit, and then you would power it out. With an electric car, when you, you can power it out much, much quicker. You have to slow down more because of the weight, but then you can power it out quicker. So the emphasis on where you actually lay the power down and how you drive it is a little different. But the net result is pretty much the same, if not quicker, frankly. And um, I, I find them great fun to drive. I had an iPace for a while. And I found it absolutely an enormous amount of fun to drive. And what, and what it shows up to other, other drivers is a little bit of embarrassment sometimes, you know? Yeah, I do, um, <clears throat> I do find myself having to resist the temptation to just drag race <laughs> everyone off from a set of traffic lights because I just know I'm going to win. But <laughs> It's so easy. It's so easy. But that's, that's the future of... And, you know, in the future, of course, we'll get past this sort of euphoria of, I think, these fast takeoff cars and... And we'll start to temper the performance to other, you know, essentials such as range and, and perhaps we'll bring the not to 60 times, you know, to a more sensible level for most people. Because most people get a car, don't want a good note to 60 in three seconds. And, and for many people, it's actually quite frightening. Mm. So we need, to, we need to think how we temper that, uh, that power output and, and save, save the energy for, 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 by other, for, other, for other reasons. Yeah, definitely. And now I just wanted to dig up another one of your quotes, because when we were going back to talking about the DNA and ethos of Jaguars, you've said before that it's important for them to be seen and known as cool cars. And that got me thinking that there are a lot of sceptics of electric cars. And I mean, one of the main criticisms, especially for some of the earlier models, is that they're sort of quirky looking and got that bubble car aesthetic. So in order for the EV industry to continue to grow, how important is it for designers and manufacturers to make EVs cool? Because maybe that might make the transition from petrol and diesel cars a little bit easier. Yeah, I think if you can you can shape and style a car and, and design it in a way that um, is bang up to date in terms of design and style and in terms of feature, it takes away a lot of these um, these reasons for not buying. And um, you know, I think we have to persuade people that uh, electric cars are extremely cool things anyway. And I think it's quite important that they represent themselves and they, and, and they show themselves up as being something that's, that's part of this century and certainly this decade, um, or indeed the next decade. 
So that aspect of it, I think, is quite important. Uh, and then that's happening. That's coming, you know. And if anybody's be skeptical about it, I, it, you find it's one of two reasons. One is because the the um, the infrastructure is, doesn't suit them, which is going to be a case for many many people for a long time. Or um, or they love the sound of a V8, you know. Well, have the V8 as well, you know. Keep it in the garage somewhere. Play with it at some point. Or um, you know they just they're just skeptical about the whole notion of an electric electric vehicle because of the the its sort of inheritance and in history, but uh, people get over that absolutely. They are cool things. They're great fun. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree, but I just wanted to go back to when we were talking about the design process of a car, and like I said, I don't know too much about the ins and outs of the whole process, but. When you're the head of design of a manufacturer, how much fun are you really allowed to have with the look of the car? And what's the sort of balance between making a car look really cool and that sort of practicality and pragmatism that an everyday car needs? Well, it depends what you're doing. I, I always say that when you start off designing and creating anything, whether it be in the engineering, whether it be design style or even package, you have to decide at the very beginning where your criteria are and where your, your objectives are. And you have to put them in a hierarchy of order. You have to put them in an order of importance. Now, the style of the car is very important. It always was at Jaguar. If you think a sports car, it's extremely important because that's what people are buying into. They're buying into the dream. They're buying into a lifestyle. So if that's very important and it takes, it takes priority over some of the practicalities, then so be it. It will win over. And you know, if you want to carry great big wardrobes around, then buy a transit that's designed, that's what it's designed for. And so, you know, and then somewhere in the middle, you get your family car, which has to do a bit of everything, and you have to take on board a bit of everything to make it work. Um, so my view is to, to, to give every point of objective a hierarchy and discuss a hierarchy with everyone involved, which includes finance, marketing, packaging, engineering, you know, safety, cost, weight, and then come up with a proper hierarchy that says this is what this vehicle is going to be. And that, that's a fairly stringent list that comes up when you, before you start the car. But I do find that people are always pushing for, vying for, for importance in terms of what, what is more important than the other all the way through the process. And as a designer, you have to be prepared to go and fight your corner and make sure that you, you win what is, you think is important and what you think is important for the customer. And, you know, it's a difficult job. You have to be a bit of a politician sometimes. And so, yes, you have inputs. When we start a car project, we have over 300 inputs, whether it be metrics or, or usually metrics of some kind. And uh, you have to work with them. And sometimes you have to renegotiate these inputs so they don't interfere with other inputs, especially the ones that you feel are more important from a, a design point of view. So the whole process goes on for four years. So you come up with the design, you get an agreement. This is what the car is shaped like. This is the comfort. This is the, this is the feature level. This is the safety. And they're all measured. <clears throat> and then you have to protect it. And as it goes through the process of feasibility and, and production and manufacturing, things are pushed into change. And as they're pushed into change, you have to stand there and either demand it cannot change, you have to find another way through it or accept the change and work with it, you know, depending how the pressures go. And so that's what design is about, is about taking all the inputs, and dealing with them, and, and working, not hoping, but working with those to come up with the result at the end that you feel is right for the product and the brand and what it stands for. And when you're working with a brand like Jaguar, it's a very difficult one because style is very, very important. But, you know, when you're getting into the cost of a door handle or a or the size of a wheel and the cost of a wheel, the weight of a wheel, and you have a very strong point of view on it, or the other materials you put inside it, but the, you know the cost of it is prohibitive. What do you do? Well, you go and find that something else that you want to take money out of, so you, you can pay for it. So it's a huge balancing act, and you have to really understand what's happening on the whole vehicle all the time in order to to you know just protect it. So when it comes out the other end, it's hopefully what you wanted or what we wanted as a team, what the brand wanted, and most importantly, what the customer wanted. It works. 
of course there's custody, of course there's compromise, but that compromise is dealt with negotiating what is more important than, than the next thing. That's how I deal with it. I love talking about electric cars and cars in general. And I also love to express how, how the process works because, you know, people think we draw something and it gets thrown over a wall and somebody will try and make it. It's not like that at all. It's as far away from that as possible, you know. So. See, that was quite eye-opening for me when you said that the design process of a car can take four years. And I mean, is that particularly long or is that about average? Yeah, I mean, people, some people say it's three years, but you'll find they've been working on it for a year beforehand when they right. say that. You know, so it depends where you pick up the starting point. But you'll find from the very first point, pencil to paper and, and talking about it to the final production car, it, it's, it's on average four years. I, you know, I, I think some, I'm sure the Chinese will do it in two years. Um, you know, I'm sure eventually they're going to produce cars, which we'll all be buying anyway. So, but, it, you know, I, it's it's a fairly standard three to four years. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And now just to finish things up, and I am going to ask you to exclude the I-PACE from this answer. And as well, I don't mean to embarrass you with this question as well, but I mean, many people would consider you as a British design icon. And so, I was wondering if you could sort of handpick a couple of the electric car models that are out there today and see if you can give them the Ian Callum stamp of approval. Yeah, I won't criticise, uh, you know, other brands, although there's some stuff out there I think is probably a little bit fussy. But in terms of, of the stuff that's out there that I look at and admire, I think Porsche is doing a really good job. Um, I think that uh, the um, Taycan... When it came out as a concept, I knew immediately when I looked at it, it wasn't going to be feasible like that because there just wasn't enough space in the car mm -hmm. to put everything it needed, especially with a with a skateboard platform. Uh, but I think what they've done is an extremely good job. And, um, you know, we were doing a similar car with XJ, unfortunately, that one you won't see, but uh, that was uh, something which uh, I think would have been a true competitor to that car. Um, I think the Audis are, are quite exciting. I've always admired their design and, and uh, their sense of uh, excitement. So I think the electric Audis are looking quite good. Um, I, I, some of the other ones are just a little bit conventional. I think they could be a bit more exciting. Um, I think the Mercedes is perhaps a little bit conventional looking. It's very hard to decide. In fact, the e-tron is perhaps a little bit conventional as well. Having mentioned Audi, I think the sports version is very good. But really, that's all I want to say about those cars. I think um, the little ones will, will come to maturity uh, fairly soon. You know, you're getting cars, of course, like the Golf have got electric uh, alternatives. So they look like Golfs and you can have a petrol driven one or you can have an electric one. But uh, the new Volkswagens that are pure electric are, are quite interesting. You know, they're, they're, they're well thought through. And what is interesting, they've taken on a completely different style ethos to their conventional cars. So, and that looks to be very, very deliberate, actually. So they can create a whole new brand out of it. I think that's quite a deliberate ploy on their part. But I think it's not so much to make it look different because they're electric. I think they're just trying to create a new image for the Volkswagen brand. So when they become all electric, which might not be in too far distant future, then you've got a whole new car company.